That'll work then. Oh, there I am. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started so I can stay on schedule. And as people come in, they'll come in. Uh, but we are going to record the series for our website. And uh, we're going to be talking about your adversary, the devil, over the next several weeks. And uh, so I'm excited to cover this. Uh, this is a topic that most people get wrong. I mean, they just... They give the devil way more power. They give the devil way more influence. They, uh, they misinterpret who he is and what he's like. And uh, so while it's, it's not one of the most exciting topics for me to study because it's kind of depressing and we're seeing his influence in the world. And I think as we go through the study today, you're going to be like, wow, I see his fingerprints all over the world. And um, so that's going to be one of the things. But then... My first thought was, why do we study this topic anyway? Why study this topic? And I, and I thought, you know, there's a lot of different illustrations I could start out with, but I want to start out with one that probably might be familiar to some of us. Maybe it's not familiar to you, but hopefully by the end here, it will be familiar to you. And uh, so I, I'm, I've got some slides to go with this that'll try to help us out. But uh, how many of you have um, heard the saying, if you're going to go to war, the first thing you need to know is what? Who your enemy is, right? So the first thing I want to start out with and why we're studying this is, is because we've got to know who our enemy is. You've got to know your enemy. And uh, Israel, during the Six-Day War, how many of you remember that war? Only if you studied it out, you know that it was one of the most studied wars in all of history. Because Israel was outnumbered 10 to 1. In the ground attack, they were out, well, on the ground attack, they were outnumbered 10 to 1. In the air attack, they were outnumbered 6 to 1. So imagine six of their fighter jets for every one that you have. And Israel had been on and off having issues with their neighbors. And uh, I want to talk about the Six Day War a little bit here uh, by way of introduction, because I think it's apropos to why we're going to study what we're going to study. In the Six-Day War, it was June 5th to June 10th, 1967 is when it was. Israel has been a state. Uh, this is the third of the Arab-Israeli wars. And Israel had a decisive victory. Uh, there was no doubt who was going to win this war. As a matter of fact, it was so obvious that Israel was going to destroy their enemies that the UN stepped in to stop them. Isn't that just like the UN? come in and they're known as what today? Peacemakers. You know why? This is it. The Six-Day War is where the first time they were the ones that brokered a peace deal, and it was only because had Israel kept marching, they would have taken out Egypt, they would have taken out Assyria, they would have taken out Jordan, and they were well on their way to taking out even portions of Iraq. And when you stop and you look at the map, what difference would that look like today on the map, if Israel took out all their enemies, the you, yeah, almost like they had somebody working with them, right? And Israel was stopped in their tracks only because the pressure of the United States and some other countries said, "Hey, you can't, you can't just go annihilate your enemies." And what was Israel's defense? Our enemies want to destroy us. Why can't we finish the job? But instead, they pulled back. And when they pulled back, they had already captured the Sinai Peninsula, the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, the old city of Jerusalem, and the entire region of the Golanites. And they did it in less than six days. And when you stop and think about that, when you're fighting four to five different people groups, four countries, and all their militaries, and by the way, what year did they become a nation? 19... 1948. So this is a young nation. It's not like they have all the weapons and, and they've been around for centuries and all this stuff like their enemies. They're a young country and they're able to defend themselves. Let me give you a little background. Prior to the start of the war, the attacks that were conducted against Israel were done by the Palestinian guerrilla groups based in Syria. Go figure, what's going on today? Syria with guerrilla groups or they're launching missiles on the north side of, of Israel. Uh, Lebanon specifically, and Jordan also increased their attacks on Israel, leading to the 
um, Israel reciprocating with attacks of their own. On November, in November of 1966, an Israeli airstrike on the village of Al Samu in the Jordanian West Bank left 18 dead and 54 wounded. And during an air battle with Syria, or during an air battle with Syria in 1967, the Israeli Air Force shot down six Syrian MiG fighter jets. In addition, Soviet intelligence reports in May indicated that Israel was planning a campaign against Syria. And although it was inaccurate in the end, the information further heightened the tensions between Israel and all of her Arab neighbors. So here, Palestinians are taking pot shots from Syria on Israel, and Israel finds out, all right, we're tired of this. They go and just bomb a city, right, in retaliation. And now all the, all the Arab neighbors are upset. So Egyptian president... Gamal Nassar he had previously come under sharp criticism for his failure to aid Syria and Jordan when they were attacked, now has to stand up and attack Israel. So he begins to send his military to block Israel. Here's a map of Israel prior to the Six-Day War. You see they're surrounded by their enemies, the Palestinians, the Egyptians, Jordanians, the Iraqis, the Syrians from the north. Israel is completely surrounded by her enemies, outnumbered 10 to 1 on the ground, 6 to 1 in the air. What are their odds? Not very good. However, Israel didn't sit back and wait to get attacked. Israel, prior to the Six-Day War beginning, understood the necessity to know her enemies. She took her Mossad and she took some of her other special forces and actually got her people in the government positions of the enemy. And as those Jews were sitting in the enemy's ranks, what do you think they found out? They knew where every airfield was. They knew where every general was. They knew where every tank was. They knew where every missile battery was. They knew where everything was of their enemies before June 5th. So what do you think happened on June 5th? On June 5th, while all their enemies are preparing for battle, Israel is already ready to go. And on June 5th, they're given the go-ahead. Before the war, the Israeli pilots and ground crews had trained extensively in rapid refitting of aircraft returning from sorties, enabling a single aircraft to fly up to four to five times a day accomplishing their missions. They opposed the norm of the Arab air forces of one or two sorties a day. So they're out flying their enemy five to one. Force multiplier, right? They use the same jet five times, they're using the same jet one time. Who's getting them bang for the buck here? So they got a 10 to one odds, that cuts the odds a lot. The ID, or IAF also sent several attack waves against Egyptian airfields on the first day of the war, overwhelming the Egyptian Air Force and allowed it to knock out other Arab Air Forces on the same day. This had contributed to the Arab belief that the IAF was helped by foreign Air Forces. They believed that the Americans and some other countries had snuck in aircraft in the middle of the night to attack for Israel. But it was actually Israel all by herself. Pilots were extensively schooled about their targets. They were forced to memorize every single detail, and they rehearsed the operation multiple times on dummy runways in their own country to ensure that they would be successful in battle. The Egyptians had constructed fortified defenses in the Sinai Peninsula, and these, were designed, these designs were based on the assumption that the attack would come along some certain roads that led through the desert. However, they never believed that Israel would be able to pull off an air attack. By the way, even in today, the Six-Day War changed the way wars worked. In World War II, air superiority became a thing. The Six-Day War was won on air superiority. They decimated what the Arabs had around them. When Israel saw that her neighbors were mobilizing, early in the morning of June 5th, Israel, Israel staged a sudden preemptive air assault that destroyed more than 90% of the, 
of, is of Egypt's air force while it was sitting on the ground. And if I took the numbers, they don't mean anything to you because you don't know the airframes and stuff. But it, Egypt was basically left with three bombers and about 10 fighter jets. That's it. That's all they had at the end of the Israeli attack on day one. Without cover from the air, the Egyptian army was left absolutely exposed. And within three days, the Israelis had achieved overwhelming victory on the ground, capturing the entire Gaza Strip, all of the Sinai Peninsula, all the way to the east bank of the Suez Canal. You know what that looks like? That's Israel afterwards. That's Israel afterwards. Look how big the country swelled in six days. On June 7th, Israeli forces drove Jordanian forces out of East Jerusalem and most of the West Bank. Photos and films of Israeli troops taking control of the old city of Jerusalem ended up being psychological warfare used against the other Arab countries showing they've already been beat. The UN Security Council called for an emergency session on June 7th demanding a ceasefire that would be immediately accepted by Jordan and Israel. Egypt accepted the following day. What were they thinking? Took them an extra day to decide this is over? You're already decimated. They were insignificant at that point. On June 9th, Israel launched an attack on the fortified Golan Heights of Syria, capturing it from Syrian forces. A day after heavy fighting, Syria accepted the ceasefire finally on June 10th. And Israel expanded her border to the north. Imagine fighting a three-front battle. They're being attacked from the south, they're being attacked from the north, they're being attacked from the east, and some would argue they're being attacked from the west. Because who's in the West Bank? The Palestinians. What are the odds of victory when you're being attacked from four sides? Well, if you're Israel, 100%. You know why they won? They won because they knew their enemy. They knew who was opposing them. The Arab country losses in the conflict were disastrous. Egyptians' casualties numbered more than 11,000 soldiers. 6,000 for the Jordanians, 1,000 for the Syrians, compared to Israel's mere 600 people. That's it. The Arab armies also suffered crippling losses in weaponry and equipment that would force them to not be able to do anything to Israel for decades to come. While they're building up their military, guess what Israel kept doing? Building up hers. Matter of fact, shortly after this, we know that Israel actually tested their first nuclear weapon in the southern part of Israel, making a statement to her neighbors, leave us alone or else. June 9th, mass demonstrations calling for the Egyptian president's re uh, removal from office further left Egypt in a place where they were unable to strike and there was euphoria in Israel. Six-day war. By the way, you never studied it? Go study it. It's a phenomenal story and a lot of things that happened in there that honestly the only thing you can do is describe the fact that it was God. But that leads me to, under, uh, to this topic here. Many Christians today don't take our enemy serious. We don't take our enemy serious. Who is the Christian's enemy today? There's three of them. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Who's the world? Those that are working against God, right? Those that are anti-God. What's the flesh? <laughs> My own mind, will, and emotions, right? my own being, my own uh, sinful, sin-filled nature. And then the devil, well, that's who we're going to study. So, how many of you have heard the phrase, the devil made me do it? So you've all heard that lie before, huh? Why is it that odds are the devil didn't make you do something? He's not omnipresent, right? So let me ask you a question. Who are you that the devil will waste his time on you as a Christian? If he's not omnipresent, he's not all-powerful. He's not God. And if the devil made me do it, what spiritual titan are we 
that the devil would be attacking us. If you remember in the story of Job, what, who, who picked who? God went to Satan and said, Satan, have you considered my righteous man, Job? For there's none like him in all the world. And as we get studying here, we're going to find out that a lot of things that are attributed to Satan are not Satan at all. It's us. When are we enticed? What happens when we're enticed? Our desires lead us astray. How much does Satan have to do with that? It doesn't. We can be fully enticed of our own flesh without the influence of Satan, without the influence of a demon, without the influence. Why? Because we have a sin nature. We gravitate to evil. Look at the world today. Is it getting better or worse? Are we moving towards God or away from God? The Bible, as we study eschatology, is it showing that the world becomes a better place? Or does it show the world becomes a worse place? As in the days of Noah, so will the end times be. What was the day of Noah like? How did God describe it? Only evil continually. That's an interesting Hebrew phrase, by the way. You know what it means? Every thought was always, always, always evil. Man was not seeking to do good. Man was not seeking to do right. He was completely against God. And when Noah begins to build the ark, what do they do to Noah? They mock him. They make fun of him. It's going to rain. <laughs> tell us another one. Come on, Noah, tell us another. You're building a what? A boat? Why? It's never rained before. But the problem is Noah's tied into somebody who knew, right? Guess what you and I have? We have somebody that knows. We have somebody that told us what, what Satan's like, what his devices are, what his tax are, what his ability is. And many times as Christians in modern day today, we haven't taken the time to ever study Satan. We've never studied what he's about. And then when we find out what he's about, we're kind of like, huh, I thought he was so much more. And he's not. Now, however, let me clarify something. Lucifer was a powerful angel. Lucifer was a powerful angel. And we'll see here in a moment as we get into Scripture that Lucifer was powerful, he is powerful, and will remain a powerful force in the future. By the way, if you doubt that, just think of when Jesus, in the Kenosis passage, he made himself a little lower than who? Which means, who's higher than us? Angels. So when you hear a preacher say, well, you just go to the devil and you tell the devil to... That's stupid. That's not even in the Bible. Nowhere does it tell you to go challenge Satan. You know why? He's more powerful than you are. You say, well, I got the Holy Spirit of God. Well, do you? Have you grieved him? Is he, is he fully in charge of your life to where you can go? Do you have the full armor of God on that you may resist the temptation and the attacks of the devil? Really? Let's be, let's be real this morning. Most of us we might have some of the battle weapons available, but do we have 100% armor? I like watching these video games of people that play these fighting games and, you know, their armor gets low. And uh, they're like, I got to go find armor. I got to get armor because if I don't get armor, I'm going to die. How many Christians are dying because they don't have their armor put on? So as, and I appreciate the series on the armor of God. And this, that's kind of what fired off this study, because in Ephesians there, where it talks about the armor of God, it says that you wear the armor of God so that you resist what? The fiery darts of the devil. So let me ask you a question. What are the devil's fiery darts? What are they? Discouragement? Oppression? Oppression? <laughs> yeah, look at the world. What's the world struggling with? These are his darts. This is his attack, dividing families. By the way, what was the first sin ever committed in creation? In all of creation, what was the first sin ever committed? Pride and rebellion. 
Satan said what? I will, 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 I will. What is the second sin that was committed in all of creation? Disunity. Disunity. Who went with Satan? Third of the angels. Third of the angels fell with Lucifer. So his two main attacks are what? Pride and division. Do we see that in the world today? You see that anywhere? Should you take the shot or not take the shot? Woo, you talk about a topic that will divide today. You know? We're going to talk about that a little bit in Romans 14 this morning as we study that during the morning worship time. But I want us to understand that, that he is a deceiver. He, he, he is a conniver. He is somebody that makes something look good that is evil. And we're living in a world full of that today. We see his th- fingerprint and thumbprint everywhere we go. His main strategy is for us today is to think that he doesn't exist. Do you realize that 70% of Christians today don't believe the devil is a real person? They believe that he's just a figment of the Bible that helps you to understand who God is and that he's just the opposite of God. Well, Lucifer is not the opposite of God. Why? He was created. If you're created, what can you not be? You can't be God. So he's a cheap imitation of the original. God said what? I am the Lord and there is none other like me. Well, if God is God, then who is Lucifer? He's a created angel. He's a powerful angel, but he's a created angel. In 2009, you can look this one up on the internet. I looked at I tried to find a more updated number, in two, but 2009 is the last time Barna asked this specific question. What do you believe about Satan? And 60% or the majority think that they are, as Christians, under satanic influence. 60% of Christians think that Satan can indwell them or, be, or influence them. Is that possible? Can that be real? I mean, theologically, is, does the Bible have anything to say about demon possession in Christians? Let me ask you this question. What has light with darkness? What has, what has darkness with light? What does light do? It dispels. So can a believer be occupied by the Holy Spirit and Satan at the same time? No. Nowhere in the Bible do we see that's possible. Let me show you number four observation. He hides all over the place. The whole world lies in the lap of the evil one, the Bible says. The whole world. It's his playground. You say, what about original sin? Think about this. For one man's sin, sin entered into what? So death by sin and sin passed upon all men, for all have... How did sin get into the human race? By way of Adam. Sin existed before man. Sin existed in heaven. But how did it enter into the world? It entered into the world through man. Why was the earth cursed? Because of man, not Satan. Satan has already been fallen. Why was hell created? Who was it created for? The devil and his angels. Right? That's how we know the angels did fall. That's how we know that there are angels that have fallen. Not only does it tell us in the Bible, but it also mentions it there. Well, he was created for the glory of God, just like all of creation was. But God allowed the angels to have free will, just like he gives us free will. And Lucifer decided, and we'll look at this, Lord willing, in depth next week as we get into the passages of Scripture that talk about it. Um, But Lucifer chose to rebel against God. He wanted to have God's power and God's authority, and he usurped the power of God. And in so doing, he got cast out of heaven. And when he was going to be casted out of heaven, he said, hey, I'm going to take people with me. So he took a third of the angels and was, sure, it was part of God's plan to give angels and man a free will. Well, it happened, right? Who's sovereign? (laughs) I mean, that's that's where you got to come down to. If God said it, it's his will, right? If you ever doubted in, in discipleship on Wednesday nights, we're talking about position, positional sanctification and 
practical sanctification and progressive sanctification. And you'll find out that God has a permissive will and he has a sovereign will. And in his sovereign will, he chooses what he wants to happen. In his permissive will, he'll allow people to do what they want to do and rebel for a while before he acts and fix it. Where do we see that in the Bible? <coughs> Children of Israel. When they rebelled against God and wanted their own king, what did God allow Israel to have? But he said there's going to be consequences. Did Israel have the consequences? Yeah, ask Saul, ask David, ask Solomon, ask... <laughs> Well, you know what? The original couple thought the same thing. And they still fell, even though he was there. Job 2, 2. Listen to what it says here. In, in the book of Job, chapter 2 and verse 2, it says that the evil one, or the devil, goes to and fro in all the earth. Check out what it says here. And the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. Where is the devil's playground? Right here on the earth. He has no authority in heaven, but guess what he has here on earth? He has power and he has authority. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities and powers where? In high places. Well, what are high places? It's terminology. It's Elizabethan English we don't use today, right? What are high places? Places of authority and influence, right? Where do we see demonic activity in our world today? Surprise! Right? Why are we shocked by this? Why are we shocked that there's an administration in America that's going evil? Why does this shock us? Does Satan really want a Christian nation in the world that he rules? No! So where's the oppression? Where's the attack going to come? On the nations that shine the brightest. And what two countries right now are under immense attacks Israel and the US go figure so if we don't know our enemy guess what we're going to be confused by what's going on in the world but if we know our enemy we know this is exactly what we should anticipate we know exactly we should be preparing for something great that's about to happen look at Ephesians 6 12 for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Do you realize today that Satan has not been kicked out of heaven completely? He still has access to heaven. We'll look at it. It's found in Ezekiel, or uh, not Ezekiel, uh, Zechariah. It's found in Zechariah uh, where Satan has the ability to go into heaven and accuse the saints. He has access to that. And uh, we need to be cognizant of that. By the way, here in Ephesians 6.12, do you notice a word that appears over and over again? The word against. Do you realize we are in a battle and somebody is actually against us? You have an enemy that is fighting against you. And if you're not fighting, guess what? Guess what? By the way, this blows up the whole idea that Christians can be passive. This blows up the whole thing that we can be apathetic. If we're apathetic, you're helping the evil one. You're not serving Christ. If you're able to sit back and coast in church, and you're able to coast in the Christian life, then you're helping the enemy. You're not helping Jesus Christ. If you're not for me, you're... Think about that. Who said that? Jesus did. What did he tell Satan to do when, when uh, Satan confronted Jesus? Get behind me. Think about it. Here we go. How about this one? We're in a life or death battle against Satan today. Here's the question. Whose life and whose death is on the line? The people around us. This is the reason Christians are to evangelize. If we truly understand that we're in a life or death battle and Satan is taking captives, he's taking prisoners of war, he's taking people and holding them captive, and we Christians sit back passively and say, well, as long as we stay in our church, we're good, then we don't know our enemy. We don't, know what, we don't even know what we're doing. Because we're, we're kind of like Egypt, thinking, hey, we got numbers, we got this. And then meanwhile, the devil's just sitting there 
Well, you know what? I'm going to bomb your family. You know what? I'm going to bomb your friends. You know what? I'm going to bomb your finances. You know what? I'm going to bomb your... And just like Israel was able to strategically bomb, what do you think Satan's able to simply do by manipulating some things in the world today? Yeah, he bombed them like crazy. This carpet bombed his whole life. And the beautiful thing of that is the whole theme of Job is about the sovereignty of God. It's not about trials. Do you trust God's sovereignty? Do you trust that God's in control? By the way, as we get closer to the end times, you know what you're going to have to ask? Do I trust God's sovereignty? Do I trust that God's in control? Because it's going to look like in the world there's chaos. It's going to look like in the world the enemy's winning. It's going to look like we have no power to stop anything going on. But guess what? Greater is he that's in you than he that is. And who's the God of the world? Satan. So we got to remember that we've been given promises. We've been given things that we know are in our court. Think about Ephesians 6.10 here. It says this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the power of who? His might. You can't fight the battle. That's why you hear these modern day preachers. You know what? You got the Holy Spirit. You just go tell Satan to get out of here. Yeah, you know what? Go ahead and do that. Let me know how that works. Bless me in the name of the Lord. Nope. The sovereignty of God. Yep. I love in uh, chapter 42 of Job where Job finally comes to his wit's end and he's like, you know what, God, you're in control of everything. If you want things to work, it works. If you don't, it doesn't. What am I? I'm nothing. I'm just a man. And you know what? The quicker we can get to that place in our lives, the more usable of God we become. And Job, after he says that statement, what happens? God just begins to pour blessing into his life. You know why? No longer is it about Job. No longer is it woe about Job. But what it is, is my God is sovereign. He's in control. And I fully trust him. I've been tested. I've been weighed. And I came out victorious. Then, yep. Yep. More. Yep. It is. And here's the reality we need to come to. The Lord, the, the battle that's going on today is this. The Lord and his people against the devil and his angels. Okay? The quicker we understand what the real battle is, it's not against flesh and blood. It's not against other people. Nancy Pelosi's not her enemy. You know what she needs? She needs saved. All right? Joe Biden's not an enemy. You know what he is? A guy who needs saved. <laughs> He's being used by an enemy. He's being used by Satan. And that's, that's what we got to come to the realization. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. People are not the enemy. Who gets saved? Animals or people? So what person is beyond the ability of God saving? I don't think the enemy is the government. I think the enemy is made up of people well, in the government. Read about it in Genesis 21. Yep. Yep. But let me ask you a question. Who, who's the government? People or is it, a, is it an entity of its own? Well, I, I understand what you're saying. But, but here's the catch. Right, because there's an evil person behind the people in the government. They're being, they've been deceived by the evil one. So we wrestle against Satan. We're not wrestling against those people. Those people are enacting what Satan desires. And the quicker we see Democrats are not the enemy, Satan's the enemy. The quicker, yeah, they're deceived. And who's going to tell them they're deceived? Who's going to give them the truth when they believe what they're saying is the truth? Who, who's going to take the gospel to the ones who are in government today? And see, the quicker we get out of making the excuses for why we can't do things for God, and we actually embrace the Holy Spirit that he's given us, and actually go forth with the power 
that he's given us, we're going to continue to lose the war. They knew it. And the Judeo-Christian values our country was founded on. And they put it as bulwarks. Yep. And you look at the attacks that are going down right now. Are they inspired by man or are they inspired by Satan? Well, yep. Yep. I have to close, but here I leave you at this first. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to, what's it say? How are you standing today? How are you standing against the assault that Satan has on your family, on your kids, on your thoughts, on your spiritual life, on your church, on every facet of your life right now? How are you standing against the schemes of the devil? And what are the schemes of the devil? And that's what we're going to look at, Lord willing, as we get into next week. So this was the overview. Next week, we're going to get into some of the names that Satan has called in the Bible. And uh, we're going to look at his personality and what Satan's personality is like. So let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you that we can understand it. We can know it. I pray as we study this topic of Satan and our adversary, that we understand that the people in this world today are not the adversary of Christians. It is the the spiritual beings behind the people that is the enemy. And Father, help us to make sure that in our in our trying to do good, we don't we don't negate the mission that we're supposed to have to reach people that are different than us with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That the fields are white unto harvest, but the labors are few. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth labors into the harvest. And Father, I pray that we would go forth into the harvest and we would begin to claim that which is right, that which is true among the people around us, Father. And just share hope that's there with them and show them the way, the truth, and the life. Because no man can come to the Father except through that. And Lord, may you be glorified in what's said and done in the days and weeks ahead as we share the truth about who Satan is. But as we share who Satan is, it's going to reveal to us what our God is like. And that's the beauty of studying Satan. So help us, Father, to see you high and lifted up. In your name we pray. Amen.